On August 27, 2013, Bart Palosh, 15, committed suicide. He turned the family shotgun on himself after suffering through nearly seven years of bullying in response to his Polish accent. In February of the same year, an elderly Korean widow swallowed pesticide in front of her town hall. Society, she claimed, had abandoned her. In June of 2013, Daniel Summers, a veteran of the Iraq War, joined countless of his comrades and took his own life, shooting himself in the head on a Phoenix street. His suicide letter revealed that he had been forced to participate in crimes against humanity and then intimidated by the government into covering them up. He spoke of a, bro of a broken veteran support network in which the government created a culture of fear and actively blocked the pursuit of outside help. Suicide is the deepest expression of isolation and despair that an individual can undertake. For many of us, the act is so drastic as to appear outside the realm of possibility. We are incapable of imagining a circumstance in which we would do it ourselves. As a result, we subconsciously distance ourselves from the victims, assuming that they must be somehow fundamentally different from us if they have reached such an unthinkable conclusion. Suicide is an incredibly visible manifestation of depression. But many of the scars we bear are hidden from the public eye. Often, those who appear the happiest suffer the most. Experience has taught them that the only way to resist social isolation is to adopt a facade. They suppress their anger or loneliness or grief because they know that if they don't, their isolation will only grow more profound. The sad fact is that as a society, we marginalize those who do not appear consistently cheerful because they do not imbue us with positive emotions. But a facade requires enormous effort to maintain. When that stress becomes too much, the consequences are often catastrophic. But even now, many of you are distancing yourself from what I am saying. You think that I'm talking about those social outliers you never speak of and try to avoid thinking of. The people who visit the mental health office, the people who cut themselves, or the people who withdraw from school. But the, but the social isolation that I'm talking about is all around you. The parent who calls you twice a day but never gets a response. That awkward kid in your entry whom you made fun of or that girl you manipulated into having sex with you, never to return the emotional vulnerability she allowed herself to feel. These people may never open up to you. They may never express how they really feel. Instead, they will put on, instead they will put on a smile and laugh along at jokes that make them feel worthless. But this does not change the impact of your actions. As a result of our inability to communicate with one another, we allow ourselves to be treated in a way that hurts us. By not challenging a culture that rejects emotional communication as uncomfortable and overly depressing, we implicitly contribute to a society without a common consciousness, without solidarity. A society of isolated individuals pursuing disparate ends, a society that lacks empathy, in which those who hold power are willing to treat human beings as means to a personal end. As social structures like religion and the family have weakened, so have the ties that traditionally bound us to one another. When religion acted in the spirit of its sacred texts, it taught us that we were all children of God. It taught us to believe in one another, to help those less fortunate than ourselves, and to care for one another as members of a single human family. Religion engendered a sense of connection with something greater than the individual, a common endeavor, an overarching set of values, a 
community of believers. Strong family ties did the same thing. They provided the emotional support and connection that today's society lacks. My mother, who immigrated from the Soviet Union at the age of 20, never ceases to express amazement at the notion of therapy. In Russia, as she constantly reminds me, your family and friends were there to help you get through hardship. It was always understood that she could be completely open and vulnerable with them. She still talks to her parents twice a day. We live in an age in which such examples are the exception rather than the rule. We prize individualism and independence so highly that we don't build strong connections with anyone. The spirit of capitalism reflects the ultimate ideological triumph of this individualism. No tie but profit binds us, no one responsible to anyone or anything outside of our own hedonistic pleasure. The more we affirm our individualism and freedom, the less we value connection with others. Sure, we may spend vast amounts of time on virtual social networks compiling hundreds of friends. But when it comes to real, meaningful connections, how close do we actually feel to the people around us? Can we truly confide in them? Allow ourselves to be weak around them? Do we feel safe enough to fully accept and embrace our imperfections around them? Social media allow us to present ourselves to society in the way in which we want to be seen. It is easier to hide our failings on the internet, to create a virtual persona that lacks all the imperfections of our real self. Many of us try to do the same in the real world, striving to be the person we think will be accepted by our peers. We are afraid to be vulnerable. We are afraid to expose ourselves to the possibility of failure, rejection, marginalization. We refuse to allow ourselves to be weak, constantly erecting walls that separate us from others as well as from our true selves. We do this because we are afraid that no one will tolerate our weakness, that our flaws will lead to rejection and isolation. Look at us. We students get drunk every weekend because we cannot communicate our desire for intimacy without a foreign substance to lower our inhibitions. We believe that others have no patience for our problems. And to a certain extent, we are right. In this era of individualism, we as individuals need to allow ourselves to be emotionally vulnerable. But we as a society must do a much better job accepting vulnerability in others. There are so many things we lose in its absence. Think, for instance, of your favorite books. Your connection with them is probably based on the fact that the narrator or characters were vulnerable. By reading the book, you came to understand these characters and empathize with them. Without vulnerability, we become unable to engage others on a profound level. Instead, we stick to socially acceptable small talk, not challenging others and avoiding anything that could challenge us. Because we are not challenged, because we do not grow, and we remain ever more firmly in, uh, because we are not challenged, we do not grow, and we remain ever more firmly entrenched in the rigid identity we have carved out for ourselves. Our relationships with others do not progress beyond the superficial level, and we do not form meaningful, fulfilling connections. Interactions with our so-called friends provide nothing but distraction, lacking the mutual understanding, trust, and dependence that characterizes the best relationships. As a result, we exist in isolation from one another, constantly seeking distraction from the lack of meaning in our lives in things like video games, the internet, and books. As individuals, we need to do a much better job of being vulnerable and embracing vulnerability. The void within each of us can be filled. Allow yourself to be entirely authentic around others. Stop making small talk and start asking the real questions. Seek to understand your fellows instead of assigning them a label and distancing yourself from them. Allow yourself to feel, to feel sadness and melancholy 
grief and anger and love, then express those feelings to others. You don't have to be happy all the time. And when other people express these feelings, don't distance yourself from them, but seek to understand them in understanding and in the knowledge of being understood. There is peace, fulfillment, and the foundation for growth. Above all, I ask you to overthrow the social norm that it is not acceptable to express your thoughts and feelings, regardless of their nature. Make it an unwritten law that emotional honesty is not just tolerated, but encouraged. Be honest about how you feel. Be vulnerable and stand by those who are vulnerable. Emotional honesty should not be a sign of weakness, something to be avoided, but rather something to be valued, an assertion of strength and self-acceptance. If we can create a culture of vulnerability and understanding, we will go a long way towards addressing social isolation, making our lives more meaningful, and healing the scars that affect so many of us.